Radiant Church presents Radiant Stories, a collection of stories that showcase God's faithfulness to take our hopeless situations and craft them into beautiful testimonies of His power, provision, and love. What exactly are we talking about today? I should have asked you that. Great question. I mean, I would love to talk about the... We kind of spoke about it when we were at your house. I'd love to talk about the process that you guys are in right now because I think you have a unique view because you obviously are not at the finish line yet. I say we start like at the very beginning, okay. like before it happened. Do you remember where we were driving when we started listening to the podcast? Yeah, you the, can share, yeah, share about that. So it was this summer, probably three summers ago, we started listening to a series by Ray Vanderlaan and... It was all about, like one of the main themes was about uh, the desert and just the metaphor that is used frequently in the Bible about just the hard times we go through. And one of the things he said was everyone goes through just an intense desert at some point in your life. And if you're not going through it now, you will go through it. Mm -hmm. Like that's a guarantee. And we both kind of looked at each other and we're like, I don't think we've ever gone through (laughs) a desert. Like both of us had pretty easy upbringings. We, I mean, families that loved us and got into colleges and we I, both had jobs or kid was in grad school. So neither of us had really experienced anything traumatic or sorrowful. And so we kind of not blew it off, but just knew it was going to come. But we also kind of at that point, I feel like I had a sense that he had been preparing me or us for something deep and Four months later, something like that, we started down the path of trying to have children of our own. And that's, I guess, where our story begins. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we started in November of 2016. I'll say this, too, in January or February, whenever. Have you heard of If If Gathering with Jenny Allen? Uh -uh. It's a women's conference, and I attended it in Grand Rapids with some friends. And at the end of the conference, she handed out stones to everyone. It was significant to what the conference was about. And she asked you to write down what the Holy Spirit was speaking to your heart. And my word was adoption that I wrote on the rock. After that, we were still on the road to trying for a baby of our own. The first year was really hard. We heard a lot of different things like, oh, you know, you're just stressed or I don't know, you work out too much or whatever. I heard a lot of different things from a lot of different people. And everyone has their own opinion (laughs) on why you're not getting pregnant (laughs) or what is wrong with you. But those things are not that useful or helpful. Yeah. So then I went, I went to my doctor and it's suggested that you go to a doctor after a year of trying if you still haven't conceived. So we went and then from there we started our year of basically medications and procedures, fertility treatments, basically. Right. And so it's it was a long road. I feel like every month kind of feels like a loss because you're you're like hoping for something and then it doesn't happen and then you try again and you're hopeful again and then it doesn't happen. So and I think the hardest part too was like every Christmas or Mother's Day or holidays are really hard too. Um, especially a couple of times we found out we weren't pregnant like on Mother's Day or yeah, our, on like significant holidays. Our first treatment that we'd went through, it was an IUI and it just seemed like it was so fitting that it was going to work because the day that we were going to find out if she was pregnant or not was on Mother's Day and it was a Sunday. And so we were very excited to mm-hmm. check before we went to church. And it was just one of the most like cruel, crushing feelings that you look at the test and you just, it's almost like it's unbelievable that that would happen. And at, at that point, too it's like is this is god like punishing us for something like Mm -hmm. are we doing something wrong like have we done something wrong but it just kept going and each like that was the first treatment we had done and each month like kate said was like we had lost something Mm -hmm. but that's how it felt to me at least when we were just trying like without treatments but then with treatments there's kind of this promised expectation of something greater or like it's going to work or this is going to give you this much better of a chance And then for each one of those to not work, that for me was just that much more Mm -hmm. difficult to to make through. Mm -hmm. Um, Especially because we don't have a diagnosis still. We're told we're healthy, we're all our numbers and everything that they've checked are are spot on, like healthy individuals to be able to conceive. So that was that was really hurtful, too. And I remember like being at church that day and I had to like force myself to sing and force myself to 
even just like raise my hands a little bit just because you I just remember being so upset and like I you feel so forgotten in those moments too of just I and then it makes you like want to forget God too as well so for sure goes both ways so we went through three rounds of IUI which are fertility treatments and then those were all unsuccessful and that was really really difficult because after that they suggest if those don't work then you move on to IVF which is more invasive and that's kind of like your best option ever in the fertility world. We were really hopeful for that. Everything went well prepping for that. So it's this past year. So in September, we were scheduled to have our IVF in October. And in September, I went to a training. It was a really awesome training for children in the foster care system and adoptive, for adoptive families because I was working as an occupational therapist and a lot of my kids were adopted or in foster care. I remember being at the conference and just feeling like, like the Lord saying like, this is like, this is like what I have for you. And in my mind, I was like, I don't want this. Like I have it in my job. Like I don't want this for myself, but like feeling like he's given me gifts and even in my own personality and like in my own heart to be able to be a mom to kids in the foster care system. Or even in- from an early time when we started dating, we wanted to adopt. That was something we always expected to do, Mm -hmm. but we always kind of had our own timing. Like, yeah, we'll have one or two of our own and we'll kind of evaluate and see, do we want another boy or another girl? You know, we just had this expectation that things were just going to go however we planned Mm -hmm. it. And obviously they haven't, but that kind of played into that same thing where even with the treatments, we just expected like that was going to be the thing that got us over the hump. And then down the road, we'll consider adoption because we still wanted to, but we had our own timing about it. Mm -hmm. So then we were super excited. We went to our first IVF procedure. Everything went beautifully. So many people were praying for us. We got uh, prayed for at church. And this was like the first time too, that we had really shared with a lot of people openly that this is something we had been going through for years at that point or almost two years. So it was something that we were, we decided kind of at that moment, like, We need to be more vulnerable with this and just open because all of the keeping it closed and just to ourselves just made it that much more difficult to get through Mm -hmm. because people weren't praying for us. We weren't in community Mm -hmm. about it. And it just made it feel that much more isolating because Mm -hmm. we didn't have other people who either had been through the process that could encourage us or even just people who could encourage us about it because nobody knew about it. So going into that first round, we kind of pretty widespread told anybody that would pray for us Mm -hmm. that this is what we were doing and we were just 100 percent going into it believing god was going to do this miracle yeah and at that point we had words spoken over us and things that had happened Mm -hmm. in our own personal life of like promises god's given us about us being parents so it just like seemed like it was bound to happen and then it didn't and it was the most devastating moment i think i've ever experienced After we had, you know, given it some time, we tried to see if we could do it again before the year ended because insurance changes for the new year and whatever. Thankfully, we did. We had enough embryos. And so we're like, okay, we they scheduled it. They're like, we don't normally do this, but for you guys, like we're going to make it work. So we felt like that was like, okay, like we're here we go. Another like time to be hopeful. And the stars just kind of aligned. Everything Mm -hmm. was just like God was definitely orchestrating this because Without him setting up the timing of everything, it shouldn't have actually been time-wise feasible to yeah. make this happen. So, so it just worked out just right so that it could happen before the end of the year. Mm-hmm. And so despite the fact that we were still kind of in probably the lowest low of realizing that it, the first round didn't work, but having to go right into that second round. So it was kind of a blur for me. Yeah. I don't, I don't really remember a ton of the specific details Mm -hmm. or even the emotions because it was still kind of numbing. It's pretty fast. It didn't work. All of this, not just what we had been praying for, but what so many people had been praying for. And because it was so much more public that second time, or sorry, that first time, it just made it that much more difficult to now have to tell everybody it didn't work. Like Mm -hmm. everything that you were praying for, everything that we were believing for just failed. Mm -hmm. And man, that was... That was rough. Mm -hmm. Were you guys pretty open about that part of it? Like coming back to the people that you really trusted and and spoken to and the people that had spoken over you and 
were you pretty open about that part of it too? Or was, I mean, Ross, you said that was probably one of the hardest things. For sure. Mm -hmm. It was definitely the hardest thing. And yes, because everyone knew when we were going to find out. Mm -hmm. So even if they didn't ask, you knew that that's what they were wanting to know. And even if we didn't tell them, they knew based on just our, our demeanor, we didn't have a joyous spirit about (laughs) us that day when they knew that that was the day we're going to find out. So because everything is very planned, it's not like it might be this day or that day. Mm -hmm. Like you go in for blood test and that's determines explicitly Mm -hmm. yes or no. Mm -hmm. There's no, maybe let's try tomorrow. So because everything was planned, a lot of people knew the day that we were going to go in for the Mm -hmm. test. So we did tell a lot of people, some people, kind of found out because we didn't say anything so they just knew it was not positive um i think at that point too i felt like such a burden like here's another prayer request it's the same thing like i've been going up to prayer get prayer for so long for the same thing and Mm -hmm. so that was hard for me too of just being like no it didn't work can you pray again we have Mm -hmm. the you know like at some point it's just like i just don't want to ask people because it just seems like this is it's not working. Even though I know people care in your mind, it's just like, I don't want to be a burden. The devil can... The devil is deceiving during these times. Get in in very clever ways to He's, make you feel yeah. like you shouldn't ask for prayer. Yeah. I mean, it's... Totally. We've just seen, isolate you more and more. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And realizing that too gave us more confidence to be more public that first time because all of those moments of isolation, we realized that that was... Yeah. why we felt so depressed or like the state that we were in, why we were in that state. So then feeling like this is the only way to combat that, but then for it also not to work and not only for it to not work, but we had basically like our number was basically zero, which is very definitive, but it was almost like there was absolutely no chance that that was going to work, hmm. which was to me because I'm an engineer, I'm analytical, like the numbers mean something like that was devastating for me alone Mm -hmm. just because it felt like that was telling us it's not going to work period so then we did our second round of IVF right before Christmas and it was successful we found out we were pregnant so you do a blood test and then two days later you you do another one to make sure that Mm -hmm. your numbers are increasing for pregnancy and so that was like I'll never forget that day I like went and surprised Ross at his work to tell him and he was gone. So that was <laughs> awesome. <laughs> I remember our celebrations and I remember like my cry was different. You know, it was just like this deep emotion of longing. It was like, thank you, Jesus. We're finally like, finally worked. And then um, asked for prayer again from friends. Like, you know, and I and I should mention that the nurse was like, your, you know, your number is low. She wanted me to be aware of that. It wasn't like super high. But it was in the range of pregnancy. Yeah, mm-hmm. it was well over the mark for what they deem clinical pregnancy. Yeah. So yeah. it wasn't like on the border where they're like, yeah, it probably isn't going to work. But it was still below the number that they like to see it. Mm-hmm. But still, for us, this was the first time we had any inkling of hope that our bodies work, that mm-hmm. you know, physiologically this could happen. Yeah. So we kind of took it as like, it worked. So then I went two days later to do the blood test and found out that it didn't work and the numbers didn't increase. So then it was just like another like, oh my gosh, like here we are yet again. And this is just having that, that, that I think felt the most cruel to me of just like, God, like, why would you allow that? Like, why didn't you just do this, the zero number again? Like, why would you even give me a glimpse of, of that hope? And I think anybody who experiences miscarriage or loss can relate to that feeling of just like, why? Like, and, we, and the answer is we're never going to know why. Like, that's, it's just something painful and it happens in our broken world. And th- at that point, I was like, I'm done. Like, this, mm-hmm. I'm so over this. I already feel like a failure. My body can't work. I felt like a failure for Ross in our marriage. A lot of feelings of disappointment, and those can turn into, you know, bitterness and just felt very, very forgotten for sure. I remember like just praying, like, why did you give me these desires in my heart? Like this whole, my whole life, like I've been a nanny. I've been around children. I work in pediatrics. Mm -hmm. I love child development. I feel like God created me to be a mom and 
it's like, and so I remember praying like, God, just make me more of like a businesswoman, like make me more of like something I'm not, because this is really hurtful that you would like create me like this. And I can't like, and we're, and you're not letting it happen or like, you know, just change, change it up. Like I'm willing to give it up and do something else, else if that's what you want me to do. I think part of the hardness too is clinically it's considered a miscarriage and despite it's the fact that chemical pregnancy at that point. Yeah. But just the, the poignancy of the words mm-hmm. that are used when you are pregnant and then it doesn't work. Like that seemed like it was just another one of the times that it didn't work, but for it to have technically happened, we had a child and then it didn't survive. That was another moment where it just kind of had a heightened sense of emotion to it that we just had a miscarriage. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think the time we went to do our post-op with the specialist and that was what he reiterated many times and I think the point for him doing that was to encourage us that it did work like it your body did work but the more he said like you had a miscarriage just made it that much more difficult to realize Mm -hmm. what had just happened and I don't think either of us had really processed that occurrence until that appointment where we realized truly what had happened Mm -hmm. and so that just made going into Christmas, again, another one of those times where it's supposed to be joyful, that much more difficult. Mm -hmm. So now the story gets really good, I promise. (laughs) This has been part one of Kate and Ross's story. We'll be back next Monday with more of their testimony. 